Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Heat Press for Profit podcast. I'm your host today, Josh Ellsworth. I'm excited to be back on the show uh, and hosting today while our normal hosts are traveling out to different conferences uh, and events around the industry. Uh, And we have an exciting show for you today. So uh, if you're just logging in, whether that's through YouTube, LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, anywhere you're watching, make sure you shout out uh, to me, say hello, tell me who you are, where you're watching from. Uh, or if you're watching it or listening to it afterwards, make sure you uh, like and subscribe uh, to wherever you're listening to the podcast. And so today's show is all about print on demand, uh, a very important topic uh, in our industry right now as we think about producing only what we need, exactly when we need it, at the quantity that we need it, and getting it to the customer on time, just a smarter way uh, to go about the business. And so there's been this whole shift Uh, to print on demand over really the past decade, maybe more, uh, but that is accelerating right now. And so uh, from a stall standpoint, we've made some uh, big decisions uh, in print on demand. And uh, one of those decisions was to uh, make an investment into a technology company called Fulfill Engine. And I'm so happy to have Jason Tompkins, one of the co-founders of Fulfill Engine uh, on the show today as we have a discussion around market observations and print on demand opportunities and really introducing you uh, to Jason and uh, the company. And so let's go ahead and bring Jason on. Hey, Jason, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, so uh, we have folks watching from all over the world, uh, really, um, or listening from all over the world. And uh, we hope to give uh, an outlook for print on demand, kind of where the where we're at today. Uh, with print on demand, what that means, what the opportunities are uh, for folks in the market, whether it's small businesses or big businesses, how they should be thinking on print on demand. And hopefully uh, we're real practical here. Uh, Give some advice on something they can take home, actionable and implement today after the conversation. But before we get all deep uh, into all of that topic, it's a big topic. um, Why don't you tell uh, those folks listening since they may be meeting you uh, virtually for the first time, kind of your story, uh, who you are, where you're from. Yeah, so uh, from Charleston, South Carolina, 80 degrees today. It's beautiful outside. The Gators are out on the golf course. It's awesome here. Um, You know, my family had a small print shop. Uh, We did paper printing, and we had no idea what we were doing when it came to running a business. And so what we realized is competing against Vistaprint was going to be really tough. And we got introduced to apparel printing thanks to none other than stalls, went to a conference, saw these beautiful, shiny heat presses and realized that all we needed to do was buy a heat press. We could start making t-shirts. So that's how we kind of got our start in the apparel industry. And then through some relationships with nonprofits, we realized there was really a gap for servicing nonprofits with apparel and running fundraisers. And so I recruited a couple of my really good friends, awesome, talented engineers, Adam Hickey and John Bell. And we started to write our first application, really trying to power nonprofits. And so that was about in 2018 when we first launched Print Your Cause. And from there, we realized that software in our industry just wasn't anything out there to connect the actual orders we were pulling in to actually doing the fulfillment. And so instead of trying to scale our company via people, via equipment, we did have to do that, but we really focused on the software. Uh, And when COVID hit, we made a big pivot to start doing more e-commerce fulfillment. Uh, more fulfillment for marketplaces, fulfillment for other, you know, applications and, and larger enterprise companies. And instead of trying to grow our own fulfillment, we realized we wanted to work with partners. And so that was when we started to really develop the system that not only manages different order channels, but it also manages the orders on the production. And we worked with great partners. Um, our very first one is U.S. Colorworks in Charlotte ton of credit to those guys. We built our software for our, really our own needs. And so a couple of years ago, we realized the software we built was more valuable than the company we had built it for. And through our own experience, realized that we could bring all of what we had learned, what we had built to empower other people, to empower sellers, suppliers, decorators, really everyone in the supply chain to partner with. And that's how really Fulfill Engine came to be. And now I uh, can't say uh, how happy I am that we've got this awesome marriage with stalls. Yeah, yeah, and so we are so excited. Uh, when I first met Jason and heard his founder story, 
I won't go too deep into it because it was actually uh, over dinner and there was some live trivia going on. So it was like a two hour story that he just condensed into two minutes for you all. So uh, consider that uh, fortunate. But I was super excited because um, this was a company that had walked in the shoes of a typical apparel decoration entrepreneur and experienced all of the difficulty uh, and, and thought through a lot of the challenges with scaling and growing and getting to what everybody really aspires to get to. And that's what they would deem uh, success in their apparel decoration business. And so when I saw uh, Jason software and way they developed, I'm like, oh, wow, we need to make this accessible to anybody who wants to print apparel, but specifically uh, to print apparel on demand, because that's really what the software uh, was rooted in. But uh, this isn't um, a sales presentation on the software. We're going to get into that maybe a little bit later and talk about the importance of technology to making all this work. But let's start with, I think, something all apparel decorators can attach to is uh, the print technology and what we really need to be thinking about when we look at how to actually print a shirt for print on demand and what technology sets we feel like are eligible uh, to be able to do print on demand, which effectively means we have to be ready to print as little as one piece uh, to be able to really power print on demand. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. When you're spending the cost to set up a job on a bulk order, it's okay to touch that order with a human, right? To set up the job, to set up the artwork, to order the blanks, right? To put it in your CRM or your system, right? Uh, if you're doing that on quantities of one, that's got to be automated. It's got to be efficient. There can't be all those touch points. Otherwise, you're going to be losing money. It may feel like you're making money. You won't be because you'll be spending so much time or your team will be spending so much time on that order. Yeah. Yeah. And so the technologies that were really available to power the printing of the garment itself um, historically was direct garment, which still holds a pretty prevalent place in the print on demand space. Yeah. Um, I would say dye sublimation, um, which does a nice job. Um, I'd probably add what engraving uh, to that mix for, for hard goods. Yeah. Okay. That's what's been really neat about the last couple of years. Honestly, you know, five, six years ago, <clears throat> it was DTG it was dye sublimation. Like that was it. Right. And the evolution of what we've been able to bring with the software and with really the technology that's out there, like direct to film um, or empowering, you know, decorators to be able to do embroidery on demand or engraving. Both of those techniques were traditionally things it was unheard of to do quantities of one. Um, mm -hmm. And with the, you know, with direct to film, with DTG, with, with, you know, dye sublimation, we've seen all the value of being able to do on demand and with technology, with process, with flow, you can have embroidery done on demand and be really successful and really profitable with that. Um, as well as other heat applied graphics that we've seen come along. Um, it's really changing the game in terms of the variety of print techniques that are available, the variety of different apparel or hard goods that can be decorated on demand has really evolved, you know, quite quickly over the last few years. Yeah, and I think that like you'd have to be under a rock, I, I believe, and, and those folks listening probably aren't. They're tuned into our show weekly um, to to not understand the uh, impact and the disruption of direct to film. So I don't necessarily want to catalog all that because that's spoken about pretty much on everything I listen to uh, inside of our industries. So I don't want to be redundant there, but when you look at you know kind of where we're at with direct to film, direct to garment, and die sub kind of is the key three um, with embroidery, kind of docking that as a unique technique. Like, what do you think um, are some of the things we're, we're missing when we look out across uh, direct to film or those print technologies? Like, are there any gaps we need to close with the technology things from like a true print technology that, that may be holding sellers back to achieving their, you know, their sales goals and really maximizing the opportunity? Yeah, I think it's, all about the systems on the front end that are actually collecting the orders, right? Uh, if you don't have a system that essentially is hooked up to the fulfillment and you don't have the recipe for that production ready to go and you're taking orders in and then you're having to by hand set up those print technologies, then that's an issue. And that's where DTG and dye sublimation, you know, they shined early on because it was so easy to just upload a PNG, right? It's a digital process. And so there was never any touching of the artwork, right? Whereas with engraving, with embroidery, even with direct to film, there's gotta be some technology along the way that's getting those jobs all set up. But as we all know, there's a lot more 
than just taking an image and an order and then magically like getting it to that printer. There's a bunch of steps in between. Like, what are we going to do mm -hmm. with the inventory management? How are we going to get the blanks? What are the blanks we're going to support? And I think that's where technology and workflow really comes into play for decorators, large and small, for how they're going to do their fulfillment. Yeah. And, and like, there's nuances to almost every one of those print techniques. Yeah. Um, and, and really, I think that's why there's the excitement around direct to film is like there's less restrictions really because with uh dtg like we were a little bit restricted as far as like what fabrics we could go to and there's some complexity with navigating even garment weights and, and treatments within those fabrics right with the pre-treat process and how that would work and sublimation we know there's a very limited set of products certainly in soft goods and apparel that we can decorate with it but hard goods you know there's lots of opportunity there and so when when you think of that like landscape if i'm a decorator and i want to do it all myself which is i think debatable as we move forward and we can have that conversation around trends and our point of view but if i want to do it all myself like do i need to own dtg die sub and direct to film to really be able to maximize uh, my potential or what what are your thoughts on the that mix had you asked me that four years ago i'd have said uh yeah dtg is definitely what to invest into die sub uh if you have the if you have the market, if you have the sales channels, then yeah, maybe you could get into die sub on some like hard goods, probably not on soft, you know, on apparel. And it's just incredible the quality that, you know, stalls is able to output with direct to film and just the diversity of what you're able to decorate on with it versus dealing with the headaches that you get with DTG. I mean, I, I get PTSD talking about and thinking about, oh, did this shirt come from was it made in Nicaragua or was it made in Haiti? Because the way the inks are blended with water, when you get pre-treat, it stains the garment. And it's like, we're talking about down to that level of what country it was made in. If you can DTG on something, let alone actually looking at the style and like looking at the fabric contents, all of those different things. And just because of that process and same with the ISUB, because you're actually, you know, impacting the way you're dyeing that garment, Whereas direct to film, the, just the ease of being able to decorate with it, um, the time it takes, you know, DTG, you've got to pre-treat, you've got to do so many steps, right? Mm -hmm. Multi-step process and the equipment is really expensive to invest into. So that, you know, initial investment that you have to make into those printing techniques, you know, can be drastically different. And with direct to film, all you need is a heat press. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, usually what I find in talking with decorators, like their fear around all the, and trust me, I'm the biggest advocate for all you need. <laughs> you all, everybody listening that knows me knows that, but let me, let me present the other side of it. Um, just so we can talk through it. Cause you have a unique, um, unique insights based on what you're able to see coming through the platform that's been doing print on demand for whatever the last four years. Uh, most people say, well, with the Amazon effect, is there enough time? For me to actually go out buy a transfer not have to own the printer receive the garments decorate the goods like do i need to inventory the garments do i need to own the printer like what are you seeing from like a respectable turn time in the industry for the opportunities how should we think about how quick we need to ship from when we receive the order yeah i think it's completely reasonable and i i think the industry as a whole five days you know, is, is a completely reasonable turnaround time. And the cool thing with great supplier partners out there, like the Sanmar and Alpha Broders and SNSs and Augusta and Scrub Authorities, the list goes on and on. There's so many great suppliers out there because they're diversified distribution channels and centers that they have. It's like we can get most of our stuff within one day, right? Mm -hmm. And so knowing that we can get our blanks in one to two days, knowing we can get our transfers in one to two days, well, great. That gives us three full days to do the production. Plenty of time, um, you know, to be able to get that order out the door and have very happy customers. Yeah. So uh, basically in print on demand, uh, one, one note for everybody is you are really selling virtual inventory, right? You're not making anything. You're not photographing pre-printed garments and inventorying those designs and listing them for sale. Uh, you are not even stocking the garments that you want to sell. You are finding your wholesale suppliers, making sure you're building stores or quotes or however you're transacting 
with the catalog that you have access to. Um, and then basically only ordering the garment, only buying the transfer or producing the thing uh, when you have this the sale. That's the definition of printing it on demand exactly after you receive the money and are paid for it. And so some of the benefits of that uh, that businesses should get excited about is uh, one, less on-shelf inventory, um, less less space and, and inventory carrying cost and burden there with overhead. Uh, but two, uh, being able to have this huge product assortment of this diversified uh, partner catalog, supplier catalogs, where I can effectively sell thousands of SKUs and thousands of uh, items, uh, lots of different uh, brands. But um, to your point, sourcing that stuff like is tough. Right. I, uh, I listen to a bunch of different industry podcasts and I know like, you know, there's been a solution created recently to go out and source that stuff for people. Right. Where you can basically log on to a website. It, you can enter your uh, blank accounts from the big three or other suppliers. And you can basically go to one place to check inventory instead of going to three websites. Right. Saving a lot of time for the business owner. So but but I think there's a progression of that. So uh, share with the audience how you've thought about sourcing through online stores and through like sales in general yeah we've always taken the approach that we want the end customer to not realize the person who's buying they don't need to realize that this is print on demand right so by hooking in to all the different suppliers and knowing exactly where every garment is here in the u.s and knowing what is available in inventory and really passing that through through all of our partnerships that we have in the integrations, well, great. Now when someone's coming to a store and if a specific Travis Matthew Polo is out of stock uh, in a certain size and color, well, great, we can flag that and make sure that that customer is not getting a bad experience ordering something that, that then who knows when it's gonna be restocked. But the management of that is a nightmare if you don't have automation and you have someone manually going in and updating SKUs. You had mentioned thousands of SKUs. The reality is it's hundreds of thousands of SKUs across all these different styles and colors and sizes. And so having automation power, whatever the front end solutions are, whether it's a store, you know, on our platform or a third party platform or Shopify, whatever it might be, having that experience can really give you the confidence to add as many styles as you want to a store or offer to your clients and not have to worry about that back and forth of, oh no, this is out of stock. Let me help you with a different product. And then actually sourcing those blanks that you need for those orders as they're coming in. I can speak from experience, right? For, on a lot of these things, I did them myself. So early on in our company, it was me every single day, logging on, drinking a cup of coffee and doing ordering. And it was a nightmare, an absolute nightmare, right? Like I hate even talking about it. Yeah. <laughs> and that's where automation uh, for us, you know, we were able to build all these integrations with the major suppliers and take that work off our plate. So not only did we save a significant amount of time for ourselves, we saved the space of not carrying inventory. We give our customers way more SKUs and styles than they could ever imagine. And they're getting a great experience when they're going and buying things because we're only exposing what's available. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And so um, thinking about that, uh, you can have the confidence that you're not going to sell into a back order where you can't chase something down. Where you are going to have that customer friction, but also you can have the flexibility to try stuff. And I think Absolutely. that's part of the industry, right? Is you want a risk free way or not completely risk free, but a lower risk way to be yeah. able to put something out into market for a potential client type and Maybe they'll buy, maybe they won't, but you would want to be able to have some misses on that without having the pre-printed inventory or even the blank inventory sitting uh, behind it. And so one interesting observation that I want to share is like, there's this concept of printing only what you need exactly when you need it um, and sourcing it only exactly when you need it. But we've heard from other decorators that at some point, like if this is a known thing, like, hey, the client is Coca-Cola and we know they're going to buy X amount of the Coca-Cola logo on front of the t-shirt. Like there's a couple ways we can go about that. We can either get that screen printed, put it in inventory. So it's pick pack ship, right? Or what I've seen more often than not is we can stock that logo in a screen printed transfer. And so 
thinking about the benefits of even stocking transfers and managing that and only committing that transfer to size, color, item, yeah. whenever it's sold, leaves a ton of flexibility and reduces the risk. Because that transfer, that white Coca-Cola logo will still be good, you know, on a, let's say on the back of a jacket tomorrow versus the front exactly. of the t-shirt today. Right? That's right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a fantastic model for programs for any type of volume that you can expect, you know, and that is coming in regularly. And like you said, you still get the diversity of print on demand. You're not taking an inventory position, right? You're not having to pre-decorate thousands of the same thing, hoping that you sell them. No, you still get that same awesome workflow uh, and experience for the end customer. But now, you know, you're able to do a printing technique that takes, you know, seven seconds to do all while offering that great front end experience and that great shopping experience. Uh, I mean, that's 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 kind of the dream. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and just uh, for those you know listening, you won't be able to see this, but I'll explain it to you for those watching. Like I did a customer visit last week and you guys will see video content coming out on this. But here's his little uh, cow logo. Right. And they, it's a really cool brand. Cash cow clothing. Right. Streetwear brand. Um, and this is like one of his major three or four logos, right? And so we made this for him in a PVC patch, 25 piece minimum. Like we'd never be able to do this just one and make to order. But yeah. if this is a like a major part of, of his brand or the brand that the store is for, we could throw 25, 50 of these on the shelf. And at this size, which is about two and a quarter inches tall, it's going to be good for a hat. It's going to be good for a backpack. It's going to be good for a left chest logo. It's going to be good for a can cooler. Like, you can have all sorts of virtual inventory illustrating this and then just pick and press and sell the item. Good. So uh, we're about, well, we're probably about two thirds of the way through our podcast. Time flies when you're having fun here, but we appreciate everybody logging in and listening. Uh, I know we have uh, McKinnon Printing uh, watching and joining us on YouTube. Thanks for joining us. We have, looks like it's uh, Recreated Designs. Uh, thanks for watching us on our YouTube channel. We have our Great friends over at Stalls UK uh, watching as well. Hope you guys are having a great day. I'm heading into a great weekend here. And then, uh, of course, our folks at Transfer Express and Stalls TV. Uh, we're broadcasting everywhere. So shout out. Uh, this is an interactive show. So we have lots more we want to share. But your questions are like way cooler uh, with like guiding our the rest of our time together versus us just uh, stating it out. Oh, and one of my one of my guys is online today. Uh, Frank Good. What's up, Frank from SNS Activewear watching us on LinkedIn? And then uh, 206 Fresh City, appreciate you uh, joining us. So great, we have a question coming in. So I'm gonna pop it on the screen as I read it to the audience. Uh, Solon asks, do you see the industry retail or customer end price increasing and being accepted across the industry? Love the fulfill engine model, but the cost to us, the store is quite higher than we are seeing uh, with contract printing. So there's a lot to unpack in that question. Uh, Jason, you understand it. Want to take first crack at it? Yeah, what's I think what we're seeing more and more are the, the big sellers, the big um, kind of those clients that you would think in the past, like we'll just use Walmart, for example. Like everyone just assumes Walmart is decorating in bulk and they're stocking things and it's all inventory based. But you even have your big retail brands and stores, department stores that in the past only did big runs and distributed amongst all of their facilities. Even like a Walmart is moving to print on demand. And that's really the exciting thing about the print technology combined with software and automation can actually get those print costs down to where it is getting closer and closer to what screen printing costs. Now, that's not to say screen printing is ever gonna go away. If you're doing 10,000 no. units of a one color, yeah, screen printing is money all day for that, right? And there are gonna be cases where it absolutely makes sense to continue to do screen printing. Um, but I think with what we're seeing in the industry in general is that taking the risk for some of these retail brands or e-commerce brands, taking that initial inventory position of guessing if this design is going to be successful is starting to outweigh like the benefits in terms of what you could end up getting by going pure on demand. Yeah, and I think you have to also kind of dock it to the trends we're seeing in advertising, um, like a customer acquisition. And so we know the trend is, I think it's 73 cents or 83 cents out of every dollar spent on digital advertising versus traditional print media. And a large percentage of that, of course, is where you would expect it um, in meta, in paid, search, uh, et cetera. Um, 
And that can be targeted to a very specific demographic uh, to a customer, you know, at a quantity of one. And so you're seeing like just business model shifts that are being enabled by print on demand. So it's never going to replace, you know, printing all the employee shirts. Screen printing has a place. Nobody's predicting the death of screen printing here. Actually, quite the opposite. I think as uh, branded merchandise can grow uh, with a nice tandem of print on demand technology coupled with bulk technology like bulk embroidery, bulk screen printing. Uh, and we can add some more to that list. But that's a great question. I don't think yeah. you'll ever see price parity with bulk run screen printing, but you'll see, uh, I think, higher perceived value, especially if you're in an e-commerce store format where they're they're transacting more like a consumer rather than a bulk buyer uh, and able to have those advantages of, of choice um, with styles and getting exactly yeah. what they want and not being like everybody else. I think that's the key there, what you're saying, Josh, is that the choice on the e-com side is that you can have all these different options. You can have the pre-decorated in inventory. You can have the screen print transfers ready to go across a large variety of SKUs. And then you also have other printing techniques that you know are truly on demand just in time. Yeah, great. So we have a fantastic question. Um, first shout out to uh, Dolores, thanks for watching. And then Mary from uh, watching in Fort Worth, place I love to travel to. Um, it, unfortunately, it doesn't say the name of who asked this, but I love the question. So someone on LinkedIn asks, how do you think about accelerating trust of print on demand? So let's first focus on like that insinuates that there's a lack of trust in print on demand. Let's talk about kind of where that's come from historically and, and, and then what can we do about it? Yeah, I think there has always been a little unease when it comes to say like DTG, especially. Um, everyone wants to offer or you know people who are doing pod early on the focus was was dtg right and so i think a lot of decorators who were doing dtg were trying to push the boundaries on the type of styles and the type of shirts that you could do it on but as we've already kind of discussed it was a limited number of styles that really were dtg looks really great mm -hmm. and then you have certain designs and colors where it just doesn't doesn't look as good as or maybe it doesn't last the wash tests and it doesn't hold up like a traditional screen print, right? And that's where I think direct to film really is earning back the trust that, hey, this print technique actually can last as many washes as a, as a screen print, right? And so a uh, technique like screen printing where, you know, it's been done for so long, right? Like thousands of years, right? Screen printing has been, has been yeah. around, okay? So like, this is very new. And so like, how do we, earn like you said it's a great question dude. um i think direct to film is doing a pretty incredible job of that as the technology on the printing side gets better and better the gap is going to continue to close if not completely close already yeah and i'll add another thought like my perception of it is that dtg moved pretty quickly in the print on demand space to commodities commoditization i can't even say that right to becoming a commodity how about i'll say it that way <laughs> tongue twister um and, and because it was a race to the bottom and you know because of some perceived quality issues and some people who accelerated those quality issues where they were real um but it's tough to like create uh unique value on dtg like you can do it through speed and price um, Sorry. the quality of DTG is kind of like the quality of DTG. And I know there's nuances, but from a consumer point of view, most of the stuff I've seen, um, a large assortment of it is like, Hey, there's going to be some potential quality misses across the shopping cart. If you have a tea, a fleece and another product, they're probably not going to all look the same, even coming off of the same DTG printer. So right away, you're like, what's up with that? Yeah. Right. And then, um, add to that the fact of the majority of the shirts had kind of like um, bulk pre-treat rather than like spot pre-treat with just the print zone and your instant as a as a consumer or somebody receiving that package your instant reaction is oh my gosh there's like this rigidity to my shirt that's the pre-treatment zone now we know it washes out but that first experience is everything and so i think there was a lot of um mistrust there and also misdelivery so what I would encourage uh, everybody listening is, as you think about accelerating trust of POD, I'd say think about how you can accelerate trust on how you deploy POD, because it's no longer just a commodity model where it's, hey, we're selling DTG t-shirts. That's right. right. It's the, the assortment of logo techniques, of products, of brands that I can approach 
uh, high-end synthetic fabrics. You've mentioned Travis Matthew. We can go with, you know, Under Armour. We can go with Adidas. Like we can approach higher end pieces and craft a lot more uh, value and like take premium decoration techniques like direct to film can be like uh, emblems and patches and, and direct embroidery can be. And now we can think about, uh, I think uh, our friends over at Tag Swag coined this decorate on demand, uh, right? Or brand on demand um, versus just print on demand, right? Because brand on demand means That's right. I can use different finishes, different techniques, including embroidery. And now I'm separating myself from, from the pack. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. By re kind of training people to not just think POD equals DTG. No, actually it's a variety of decoration techniques. Like those awesome PVC patches you were just showing, like that's print on demand. And in the past, no one really thinks of engraved patches or embroidery or any of these other decoration techniques being print on demand. Yeah, and if you if you go on like Shopify Marketplace, whatever, and I'm not going to name them, but you can plug into any app that's POD, right? And when you search on YouTube for education on POD, that's what you're going to get. You're going to get this model that's like fast cash. I don't need a heat press. I can just do this and I can make millions of dollars. Well, it, it, it does require some planning and some work. I'm sorry. It just does. All right. So we appreciate the feedback. We're glad we can answer your questions. And uh, thanks for asking that. So we do have a question coming in. Uh, from MCSN Merchandise uh, says, what's the profit margin? Um, that's kind of like create your own journey, right? So you want to take a stab at that? Otherwise I can. Uh, yeah, I mean, right? Volume, speed, you know, who's your customer? Are you selling as a contract decorator? Are you selling to uh, B2C? Is it B2B? Right? There's a lot of factors that go into play in terms of, uh, of what you can expect a, a profit margin be. Yeah. And, and I think that, you know, profit margin is always related to, uh, of course, the cost of goods, but more the value you're creating for customer target and how much unique value can create. And so, it, you know, you should be expecting, you know, at least 100 percent markup on many of these products that you're creating. And in most cases, it's much higher than that. Um, but again, that, that kind of puts us into the discussion, which I wanted to get to anyways, like you can choose to do it yourself. You can choose to do none of it and outsource all of it, right? Or you can choose a hybrid model where I'm going to do some in-house and outsource. And profit margin may vary, but also um, cost structure, you know, and, and opportunity cost and time is all going to vary. So talk a little bit uh, as we wait on a couple more questions on like the benefits of a hybrid model, doing some in-house outsourcing some like most of the folks listening are decorators. We may have some only pure sellers, but most people are used to like, putting their hands on the heat press or on the printer and doing some work. So yeah. talk about outsourcing and the value of a hybrid model, even for print on demand. Yeah. Again, I can, can speak from experience on this, right? Like I used to have a heat press in our kitchen right in front of the TV and would sit there and just press in front of watching basketball games and football games, right? That's how we got our start. And then we moved into a much larger building than our kitchen, all 2000 square feet here in Charleston, South Carolina, right? We still have that building, right? And question became, we actually started out pacing our own facility with the way we were able to sell. And it turns out, okay, you know what? We're really good at selling. Uh, do we really want to grow our own facility or do we want to just do like the high touch local stuff, specialized jobs, the things that, you know, we just want to keep in house. Um, and but do we really want to turn customers away and say, no, I'm sorry. We're on a three week turnaround time. No, you lose that customer. That customer doesn't come back they're going to think every time it's going to be a three work turn three week turnaround right so we wanted to keep that same awesome turnaround time that we had developed from day one but we didn't want to stop selling right that's why we developed this model to begin with and being able to now take this model and be able to deliver this to other people who are in the same shoes as we were then and still are right like that is a model that is you know i'm really excited for people to be able to experience and tap into so now like when you have that big order that would take up all of your machines. You're like, oh, this is exciting order, but it's going to take up all of my production. What am I going to go tell my 100, 200 other clients? Like, sorry, I got to put all of your orders on the backlog because I'm working on this other big order. Like, no, be able to continue to do the same number of orders, keep your manufacturing output at a smooth spot, and then tap into the amazing decorator network that, that we've created with some awesome partners all around the US and the UK. Um, being able to then push into the system in a seamless way 
where you're not doing extra work and really getting to experience those contract rates, the quality, the turnaround time, all of it is something your own facility may not be able to output in that amount of time um, is really what we've been able to create. Uh, and, and that's really in large part to such an amazing group of decorators that are on our platform that our system can route orders to. Yeah. And then just to help everybody, because you might be like well, some of these folks that follow stalls closely, maybe like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and so um, fulfill it just. A, a little note on how stalls uh, in the Fulfill Engine uh, acquisition is going. Um, Fulfill Engine has a very powerful software that solves a lot of the challenges that decorators face, as we've talked about, right? And and we want to be able to bring that model to, you know, to everybody in the industry that's interested. And so where we're at right now with that is Fulfill Engine's been primarily for enterprise level volume accounts. Uh, we've taken the software and we've created it in a way that is accessible to a small to medium sized business. Okay. We are at the very end, uh, towards the end at our beta phase, because we want to make sure it's right before we onboard, you know, hundreds or thousands of you all into it. And so over the next, uh, I'll say three to six months, you'll be hearing about this new product offering from stalls called stalls fulfill engine that you can access in your business to help you power, uh, print on demand. And um, I'll say it as simple as that because it's kind of a modular software where you can use a lot of it or you can use part of it. And part of it, I think, will even have value to your business. Because when we look at really printing on demand, we've been talking a lot about e-commerce stores, uh, but there's also the aspect of just sending a customer in your community a quote and being able to take an order and produce it and, and get all the efficiencies on demand. And that's a part of it, too, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And I even see in the chat, Frank just teed one up perfectly for this conversation. Uh, my guy, Frank. Thank you. <laughs> there we go. Can Effie handle bulk screen printing orders now? Yes. So we are in beta for that as well. It's going really well. And it's kind of right what Josh was talking about. Maybe you have a couple single head embroidery machines or you're in, you know, you do embroidery or you do engraving or and you have a couple heat presses, but you don't ever want to get into screen printing because, you know, that's a whole nother animal in terms of decoration. Right. I can guarantee you our little 2000 square foot facility that we had no room for a screen printing press in there. Plenty yeah. of room for other things, but no room for screen printing. And so that is what the system will allow, you know, our partners and anyone using the software will now have these tools like Josh is saying, like having that ability to create those quotes for the end client to update the quote, to update the number of units, to place orders themselves in a way that's really easy. Someone who isn't a screen printing expert, being able to place orders, upload artwork, have our system, let them know that this artwork is in good shape and then have that order get routed to the closest decorator to the end customer who's receiving that. Well, now we're saving time on transit. We're saving money on shipping and all of that's being passed on to, you know, the person running the software. Yeah. Yeah. And so for a small decorator, um, you guys can see, I got my little cat press here. I used to have a heat press here. I moved it out because I do less heat pressing because I'm traveling too much for work, but, um, you know, small decorator operating in a, in a spare bedroom, right? You may not be doing crazy volume, but man, when that customer comes in because of a relationship that you've built and they want a quote for 500 shirts, like you don't have to go chase down and try to figure it out with the fulfill engine software. You can confidently say, yes, I can do it. Um, you can create a quote for the 500 shirt bulk screen printing, upload a logo. And then if your customer says yes, their relationship is still with you, right? We just have contract printing services behind you that are stalls certified that are going to print that for you and can either ship it to you or ship it to the customer uh, on your behalf as if it came from you. And so think about that. Like one of my things is I've been going to trade shows in this industry for two decades now, and it, it like pains me. When I see a small decorator with limited capital and even more limited time go into a show and walk out because they could get the financing with a screen printing press, a single head embroidery machine, uh, a bunch of heat presses, a direct garment printer, a dye sublimation printer. You would, I mean, some of you may fit that profile, but usually it's like, how are you going to learn all that? Um, why do you need to own all that? And so this is a great way not only to be able to um, increase your capacity and technology you do, but also increase your capability with decoration methods that you don't have to have in house, but now you can offer and trust to be able to grow your business. Yeah, so I love this question. Uh, we always get this question. Will this be available in Canada? So I, I know it's not like out of the gate, a yes, Jason, but like there's a whole ecosystem that makes this thing work. 
uh, in the U.S. market, and we're working on that ecosystem for Canada. So do you want to kind of give a high level on like what that means? Absolutely. Yeah. So the answer is yes. All right. And the answer is yes for the U.K. The answer is yes for Europe. The answer is yes for all these different countries and, and areas. OK, so I want to I want to get that out of the way. The key uh, of what makes Fulfill Engine so special is what Josh is kind of alluding to, is the way it connects everything that's needed to do the production. And that includes those suppliers, right? Suppliers are a key part of the ecosystem of us being able to do fulfillment and for anyone running the software ability to do fulfillment. Yes, it already has an inventory management system if you want to source your own blanks. But part of what we want to do is connect with those suppliers in Canada to make that same amazing workflow that we have here for our U.S.-based customers. And that means integrating with, you know, SNS Canada, Sandmar Canada, right? Same thing in the U.K., Rallywise, Penn Carry. Like these are going to be really important integrations and partnerships. And that is something that our team is already working on and having amazing conversations with those, those suppliers. And then hooking up and learning all about Canadian shipping, learning all about Royal Mail in UK, and learning about every single nuance, different area of around the way we do shipping rates, because our system takes care of that for you. You don't ever have to worry about going like, oh, is it going to be better with USPS or is it better with UPS? We allow you in the system to set up all your rules. And then if you want, our software will take care of that in terms of figuring out what's the lowest rate, what's the best carrier. It, it does it all for you, right? Why on earth would you want to spend the time doing that yourself when you can let software do it? Yeah, that's great. And and uh, we've already answered the question, I think, after she had asked it, but it ah, asked, will it be available in the UK? And we said, yeah, yes. I had not, I said, had not even seen that one yet. <laughs> says, that's great. <laughs> Uh, and happy Friday, Master Screen Prince. I know we're uh, we're running a little long. We like to keep this thing yeah. to about 30, 40 minutes, and that's okay. Um, we did share a link out for those who are watching live. For those who may be listening, uh, I'll verbally state the link slow for you. It's stalls.com, which is S-T-A-H-L-S.com. And then you want to do slash fulfill, F-U-L-F-I-L-L dash engine, right? Or just search fulfill engine on stalls.com. You can find all the details around this, watch a cool video of it in action in a shop. Uh, and Dave says, go, go, go. I'm loving this conversation and we're going to keep going, but out of respect to everybody that expected a 40 minute show, we're going to like give you an option to out right now, but we're going to keep going and taking questions for another 10 to 15. Uh, and we'd have another question coming in from Rachel. Are you going to be integrated with Etsy? So we don't want to give away too much of our roadmap. But I will say that uh, sales platforms like Etsy and Amazon are an important order acquisition source, uh, just like Shopify sites, just like white label stores, um, whether that's our white label store or another one. Like our goal is to power your business, to do print on demand efficiently on anywhere an apparel decorator wants to sell. Now, of course, those things have to happen at some sequence. We can't do it all at once, but yeah, we want to power our business models across all eligible sales platforms. All right. Another good question. Recommendation for connecting systems. Do you have a preference on tech stack? So um, talk a little bit about tech stack, Jason. Yeah. So Josh also mentioned this earlier. Our system is very modular, right? And so what we have seen of working with other large enterprise decorators in the past, and we still experience this, uh, you know, today is that a lot of people say, oh, you know, I already have X, like I already have a store solution, or I already, you know, have my own QR code or barcode scan to print system, or I have my own inventory management system, right? I don't want this. I don't want this part of Fulfill Engine. Um, we do have a very robust API that allows order acquisition to come in from any types of different channels. So if you have your own store platform, or you're working through, um, you know, even something like Shopify. We have an integration to Shopify. Um, we're very much all about partnership. And that's how we've been since day one. Like we want to be able to connect. We don't want to tell you how to run your business. We want to give you all the tools to be able to run it in an optimized way, but still let you make the decision at the end of the day. And so when it comes to tech stack, uh, we really do rely on our APIs. And that's kind of how Fulfill Engine was really made was from our partner saying, you know what? I want to connect with this system. Okay, don't just take our API and go hire some third-party software company to go do that. You know what? We'll build that for you because every time we added a new integration, every time we had a new supplier integration, whatever new functionality we were adding on behalf of our partner, 
guess what? The system's getting better and better. And that's what really has driven our success since day one is being so collaborative with our partners, having our partners work together, you know, in a collaborative way really drives what we work on and how really the software was built. Great. Great answer. Hopefully if there's any follow-up to that, feel free to uh, chat it back to us as well. Um, I want to hit one question while we're waiting on any final questions to come in. Like one of the things is like market observations and opportunities. Um, of course, there's the observation around print technology, alleviating administrative tasks to be able to power this, moving to virtual inventory. Um, but you can't go anywhere uh, without hearing about AI now and in many different contexts. Um, how do you think about AI when it comes to uh, print on demand? Uh, what areas should we be looking to um, leverage AI or at least explore AI? It's really fun, right? It's a really fun topic because we're going to do this recording, right? It's going to go on YouTube. And in like three months, if we did this call again, I'd probably have a whole new set of stuff I'd be talking about. It just You say it's going to be irrelevant? Your answer is going to be irrelevant in three months, you I think? I don't want to go that far. More okay. so, like, let's check in six months and see how accurate I was. How about that? All right. I like right? that. I like that. <laughs> and so if I had to say what are the trends I'm seeing, first off, everyone, this isn't new information today on uh, 4 2024 okay? Everyone's using AI to generate artwork, right? And, like, a year ago, it was nightmare fuel. You know, today it's incredible, right? And it's getting better and better and better, right? And it's only going to keep getting better. And so seeing the way artwork can be automated, not just on the initial creation of it, but like the way we clean up artwork, the way we create mock-ups, right? Like our system already can create mock-ups, but is it using AI today? Not yet, right? Will it? Probably, right? Like how cool would it be to put in prompts to say, you know what, I want a, a basketball player with this jersey and this artwork, and then it pops it out. Like that's going to help your conversions when you're selling, having like cool, different, unique mock-ups. So I see that as a way. Um, another win, I think that's going to happen in the next year. I think AI, there's going to be someone, I don't know who's going to pull it off, but someone's going to pull off the ability to take a rasterized image. And when I say rasterized, I mean like a PNG, a JPEG, something that's flat and essentially take that image and take it all the way through really every type of setup, whether that's screen separation, like why have a human do that? Or it's digitization, right? Getting it to rasterize to an actual embroidered file type, right? And I think that's going to happen this year. So six months, someone's going to come up Whoa, with it. Wow. I'm pretty sure the biggest prediction you just made is none of us are going to get spammed from all those digitizers because AI is going to replace it. Is that what just happened? Yes. yes. Now we'll just get spammed by all the DTF transfer suppliers. Yeah. That's exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. So true. I think that's a big one. Um, yeah. And then lastly, uh, one I'm really excited about and I've had in the back of my head for a couple of weeks now. I was talking to, I, I don't remember who the conversation was. So I apologize out there if I didn't give you credit for this, but I had a conversation with someone that I could see in the very near future using AI to build entire stores, company stores, e-commerce stores, where I say, you know what? I want a construction store with this logo and the construction company their brand colors are these hex codes or these colors. And I snap my finger and the entire store is built, right? Why not? You know, AI can power things like this. Yeah. I don't know if you talked to somebody else, but we had that conversation. <laughs> well, I guess great. it was you. It was you. <laughs> I talked to a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. No. And I, I mean, I think that when you look at like one of the most task driven thing that people complain about is the time it takes to set up a store. So I, I mean, that would be exciting. And again, I hope any platform comes up with it and we can integrate with it. Yeah. Like that's the key. Like let's, let's Absolutely. raise the power of the whole community and share these ideas. Um, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Not a single one of those ideas that I say, Hey, stall us a fill engine is going to be the one who builds this. And we're going to be the one who con controls the technology. You could not be more spot on that. Like we want to continue to collaborate and we don't want to ever reinvent the wheel. We want to, we want to innovate all together. Right. Yeah. And I love it. Danielle says you're, um, your concepts will be evolved in six months, not irrelevant, as I had stated out loud. Um, awesome. And then we take all the questions, so don't worry. Keep come, questions coming. We just get to them as we can. So how to print on spandex polyester material? Uh, Direct-to-film transfers can handle that if you have one that is made uh, with the 
powder to be able to stretch in the ink. And so the stalls, Ultra Color Max Transfer certainly would work on that. If you're printing your own or sourcing somewhere else, you're going to have to ask wherever you source it from. But I love uh, direct film. Actually, we just used our direct film on the uh, Noble um, NFL Combine gear, which was compression spandex like material. So it's really uh, good for that use. So yeah, just stay patient with us. We will answer your question. Just ask it. All right. Um, yeah, and Dave says automated product setup would even be great. Then whole store would be uh, real rad. I love the way Dave talks. He gets so excited about stuff. That's Dave from our uh, from our team. So good. So we're uh, coming up on conclusion. We did about ten minutes of bonus time. Um, Jason, uh, I've been asking you all the questions. Any any final thoughts or questions for me as as we wrap it up for all of our listeners today? Yeah, how are the Celtics going to do in the playoffs this year? Since we're doing six months out, we're doing predictions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I think I think what Vegas would say is the Celtics will be NBA champions this year. Um, so for those watching, I'll, I'll give you a little piece of my history. <laughs> Two things right here. So I'm a, I'm a big Celtics fan for those not watching. So what I'm holding up now is I keep this is a piece of the Boston Garden parquet floor uh, from one of the greatest uh, eras of all time. And then I was lucky enough to attend the 2022 NBA Finals. Unfortunately, the game I went to, uh, they lost to Golden State. Luckily, uh, Steph Curry is officially out of the playoffs, so I feel good <laughs> about uh, Boston's chance. 206 Fresh City. Uh-huh. Let's go. Pittsburgh doesn't have a team yet, but you know that I got sent a survey about a potential WNBA and NBA Pittsburgh expansion team, and uh, so they're they're looking at it and see if the area can support it. I think that'd be pretty freaking awesome. Let's ask uh, everybody your yeah. team and who you actually think is the is the greatest player of all time. Yeah, I mean, it's not really up for debate. It's uh, it's LeBron James and the Lakers, you know. I know it can be a polarizing subject, but, you know, other people make it polarizing, not me. <laughs> I just I just go off of the numbers and the facts, you know. <laughs> yeah, and then Frank, I'm going to flash his question just so you guys know I'm, I'm uh, a normal <laughs> person too. Last question, Josh, what shoes are you wearing? Actually, I'm not wearing any right now. I'm in my home office, but I'm a shoe guy, so I'll definitely yeah. be throwing some on uh, yeah. as I move out. But Jason, hey, thanks so much uh, for joining. Um, we uh, continue to be excited about what Fulfill Engine is going to bring to the industry. Um, you're able to share a little bit of that today. Hopefully everybody sees that they can participate in this in some way. And the reason we've done this is to help uh, apparel decorators to really uh, grow their business. So, um, yes, this will be recorded and available for replay everywhere it was bro- uh, broadcasted. So if you missed the beginning, go back, watch it. Um, thanks for listening to the Heat Press for Profit podcast and uh, join us again next week. Yeah. See you all.